Okay, everybody, well, thank you for that introduction. Um, what I thought I would do tonight is give you a little bit of background. Um, we'll go through the Earn Your Stripes project, which is a project that I'm involved in. Um, we've moved quite a lot into digital stuff, so I thought I could talk to you about what sort of stuff we've been doing, um, this kind of thing being part of it, and um, give you a little bit of sample of our training. I hear that um, you'd like to know about uh, mammals and some tracking, so we thought we could show you what we've been doing with that and, and give you some hints and tips to help you find some things out near you and then if we've got some time some questions and answers really easy answers and questions would be good um, at the end I'm going to move this along a wee bit that's all right um, okay so this is what I do um, and uh, it's been 20, I, I'm going to say it, 20 years I've been working for Scottish Wildlife Trust um, and I've just been down at Falls of Clyde the whole time. I think I've loved it so much. Uh, what I have done over that time is developed the role and uh, put my hand in probably lots of different things. Started off as a volunteer and doing my dissertation uh, at Glasgow University down there and then I was employed as a ranger. And um, from then realised that I like people and I like to um, inspire people. So we did badger watches and um, now I'm mostly involved in doing events and engaging with people. So I've got um, the elf events that we run. So we're making things for wildlife for um, Christmas and not this year, unfortunately, which is a bit sad, but never mind. Um, and we've got our hallow, I should move that. Can you see me, see that up there? You will be able to see that, won't you? Hmm. I don't know where to put it, put it down there. Um, and we've got a Halloween event too, uh, where I teach children to fly. And when they're not even realizing it, I'm te teaching them all about nocturnal wildlife and inspiring them to learn more and go and explore their own local patches as well. And I've got the watch group going as well and um, various strange birthday party themes that always seem to have a, a wildlife element to them. This one down the bottom middle is a um, fox party and um, it's also interpretation in our visitor centres and our reserve as well. Um, in about three years ago, I started up um, a partnership with Scottish Badgers and they were doing a project called Badgers in the Landscape. And what was really exciting was that um, we were able to develop a hub for badgers at Falls of Clyde and that was a kind of national hub. We also decided to do a, um, a national badger week. So that's been running for the past four years now really successfully and um, quite a lot of it's digital now as well. So we're, we're man managing to meet different people and get lots of different people involved. Um, we did a hide a, hide a a brock so it was it's a little rock that's a badger and people were hiding them all around the place and trying to find them so it's all raising awareness um, of our beloved badgers. Um, one of the most important things I feel that we did we went out to different schools in South Lanarkshire and we engaged with 1600 primary school children some of them are down the bottom there and we um, ran an animal ambassador kind of um, uh, project with them and so one person from each class would become an animal ambassador and then they would report back to the rest of the class what was happening and do more for wildlife and run a monthly club. Um, so it's been working really well. In fact, we, we still know that some local schools are running that and that's four years on. Um, they've still got their animal ambassadors. So that was really nice. And we actually won a Nature, we didn't win, sorry, we became highly commended in Nature of Scotland award um, and there's me in the right there. Um, but the thing that we're doing just now is Earn Your Stripes, it's called, and it's building skills to champion wildlife. And I suppose it, it wasn't so much of a, a big leap from the last project to this project because it was just a slightly different age group that we were dealing with. Um, we, we took everything that we had learned. We got some additional training because we realized we were going to have to deal with teenagers and they're a sort of different entity. So we had um, some how to deal with the mind of a teenager training and mental health training, um, learning disability training, lots of different things. And uh, 
and off we went. So we were funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and it really was a skills development training program um, to create the a community of wildlife champions. Um, we wanted them to care about wildlife and be the next generation. So we're about halfway through and we decided to run it in this kind of central belt here, um, which has got the highest um, uh, highest issues, I suppose, just with it being so highly populated. There's um, high rates of unemployment um, and um, big rates of them dropping out of school and that kind of thing. So um, we decided that we were going to concentrate in this area. There's also quite a lot of wildlife crime as well. So it seemed right to, uh, to sort of change people's perceptions for the future. Um, and strangely, when I was looking at this today, I was thinking that's us going into tier four and it's all that same, <laughs> strange same circle there. Um, so I don't know what that means, but anyway. Um, and who was it aimed at? As I say, 16 to 24 year olds, completely different bracket for us, um, but an interesting bracket, somebody that some groups that we don't often hit. Um, and we tried to get the ones that maybe they weren't in education or maybe they had barriers to getting involved in conservation, like um, they might have mental health issues or um, special educational needs. Um, and we went out with our partners, who are these guys here. And the idea was that um, we'd bring all our experience together. They would train us where we needed the training to and we would reach this new audience and really like it says it's always a bit funny when I write things down sometimes I'm like the optimized learning environment it really is just like get them outside you know um, not everybody's the same and trying to teach everybody in a classroom is not going to work for everybody um, so uh, you I mean you don't judge a fish and its ability to swim by how it climbs trees. I always use that analogy, you know, it doesn't suit everybody. So we wanted to be inclusive and take them outside and show people their strengths and give them real transferable skills. Anyway, I've gone on far too much about that. Another sort of offset from that was that we realised that people were getting um, a really good mental health experience, if you like, from it, you know, um, there's real science behind reducing anxiety and um, increasing your well-being and being outdoors. So it's not all woo-woo, although it was very nice lying in the grass there doing some um, tree bathing there, but uh, it, it is real and in, in sort of being focused on something like tracking is just really important to be able to just help our well-being. And I found it fantastic over all the lockdown period and everything that we've had. I'm sure you guys will have too, been nature lovers. So off we went and we did our first sessions and um, these were all hands-on wildlife sessions. We took our stuffed animals along with us, which was always a bit gruesome, but you know we explained that um, these taxidermy animals are, uh, they weren't killed, we didn't hurt them. They always ask if we killed them. Um, so we didn't hurt them. Um, they died of natural causes and we used them for education. And uh, before you knew it, they were up, they were touching them. They were seeing uh, owl pellets and, and fascinated with the fact that they were looking at owl sick and uh, really just engaging with it. So that's us, we had them hooked and we could take them outdoor training. Um, it kind of, shocked me a little bit how difficult some of them found this to be um you know it doesn't come naturally to a lot of people being outside in the first place so that was a barrier to overcome and you know we had one young person say the user looking at those tracks they just look like holes in the ground to me and they're just all the same so you know we had to spend quite a lot of time with some people but then on the other hand other people were just you know straight away they, they found that they had this skill um, that they didn't realize they had uh, people uh, on the autistic spectrum seem to be really good at you know seeing the patterns and seeing visually so it was, it was very interesting um for the techies, we had a bit of trail camera stuff and uh, there always seems to be, you know, that group that are just into gaming and all they want to do is talk about Fortnite or whatever they've been doing or Minecraft. And what is great is we can say, you know, there's stuff out here that relates and also 
this is you getting to see it for real, you know, that hole in the ground, there's something lives there, a real thing lives here and we'll prove it to you, you can find it out. And whilst they're working together and um, solving problems like how do I make this trail camera aim the proper direction um, without heading up to the sky, if I put it too low, is a, a badger going to come along and just snuffle it and put snot all over it and we're not going to be able to see it? Um, so it, it, was, it was a great experience and they learned a lot from it. We also did a kind of ranger for the day practical conservation session and you know, this group especially were so chuffed at building their bug house here. Um, some of them had never done anything like that before um, and it's helping wildlife too. They're, they're getting to see the, the process. Um, one of the girls came along and did a, a six months placement with us after that. So, you know, that is changing behaviour forever, um, which is, is fantastic. And then the earner stripes and they graduate. So it's been great. And then COVID comes along and kind of just spoils everything because we had it all experiencing and being outdoors and getting them there. And uh, now we couldn't meet up. So we had to think differently. Um, the first thing that we did, um, Scottish Badgers and um, Scottish Wildlife Trust as part of that Earn Your Stripes, we decided that we were going to make a Let's Notice Nature Facebook group, if you like, and it was aimed at anybody, um, but what we did find was families using it, teachers using it, and individuals who just love nature going on, sharing their pictures, asking people, ah, what is this? Who's left this? What kind of poo is this? I found a skull, what do you think it is? Um, and it was a great way for them to connect with nature and connect with each other as well. And we made little units, um, which you can see about here. I think I can change, let me see if I can change my pointer. Um, so we made little units that they would click on and every week there was a new unit would go on. One was about trees, one was about pollinators, um, one was about tracking. There was all different ones that you could go on and they're still all available just now. You can go on and, and have a wee look and see if there's anything that takes your fancy or even just join in on some of the nature chat. We also did um, a lot of digital stuff with Scottish Wildlife Trust. So, uh, our little small team that weren't furloughed we're all still working away hard and we uh, try to get lots of activities together to put on our learning zone um, and it, you know it's great it's it's so good we've been calling out for this kind of thing um, something that you can just search I am a child I am a teacher I want an indoor or an outdoor game I am this age and off you go and it gives you a list of all the things super um, Oh, now I can't change my, hmm, I'll need to come off my pointer. Hmm. Where did I go in? Ah, oh, that's fine. I'll do it that way. Sorry. Um, so these are some of the activities we came up with. Um, we had uh, nature's rainbow, salt dough, badger tracking, leaf bashing, sculptures on trees, um, natural salt doughs, you name it. 78 different ones so it was doing pretty well and we tried to bring in as well an element of well-being um i know cumbernauld living landscapes have the wild ways well and they gave us some training too and you know we've been sold on it it's it's brilliant you have to be active learn uh, give connect and take notice and if you manage to do all those things or some of those things you uh you will be well in yourself. So um, so we try and bring that into everything that we do now. It's, it's a really good concept and it is stemmed from the government's um, five ways to well-being. So the last thing we kind of changed and started doing was our YouTube. So a lot of the activities that we had developed were made into, I think there was about 20 odd, made into little films too. And um, from that, we realized that people wanted more. People wanted a bigger segment, like a 10 minute film to learn about various different species. And, and they've gone really, really well. Um, I was in charge of badgers and foxes and trees, which are all out there if anybody ever wants to go and see them. 
So that's us. We're gone totally digital and this is my back garden. Um, and during lockdown, that's where I had to, to engage with people. I was so lucky actually to have my garden there um, and 25 steps, sorry, 325 steps down to the right is a badger set. So um, I was able to virtually take people on a walk and um, with the help of Elaine, who would be behind the, the scenes doing PowerPoint a bit, she'd say, right, go over to Lindsay and she'll tell us what she's found. It was all uh, quite exciting. Um, and now we're developing that into four main virtual models, uh, modules, sorry. Meet the mammals, tracker school, and those two things we're going to look at later, um, and threats and championing wildlife. Um, and the threats, I just wanted to talk about those briefly. Um, the threats, we, we wanted to talk about that. We needed to put it into perspective. There's there's a lot that the young people are concerned about these days. And, and we know with climate change um, and all the young people getting involved and, and being activists and things, uh, it was it was really important for them to, to know what to do because some people aren't good at standing up and talking. So what else can they do? Um, so we taught them about the various threats. We had a wildlife, um, a wildlife crime event where we had a wildlife crime officer come along and he was able to talk to them about wildlife crime. We had scenarios for them to sort things out. And um, and we, we talked about different ways that they could champion wildlife. And one of them being um, to do some stop motion, like animal activism. So. I'll show you what I mean by that because every time I say that to people they go what what does that mean and we, we did our own little one um hopefully this will work it's just about 30 seconds oh. and I don't even know if you can hear the music for that <laughs> So you can see it's just a little bit of fun and we're encouraged and we've made a, with the youth, Scottish Youth Parliament, we've made a little video on how they can do that themselves and really use it for some activism. Um, so that's been quite exciting. Um, so now it's your turn. Um, we've got Meet the Mammals and Tracker Training. and I'm not going to talk too much about where it's all came from. I'm just going to get kind of right to it now. Um, Oh, here we go, let's move to the next one. So, I've picked five mammals, and the astute of you will realise that one of those is not a mammal, but that was part of the logical thinking that we wanted um, the, the young people to realise that, you know, okay, that's not a mammal that I will hear, but it does eat lots of mammals. So, it was very relevant, and it's really interesting as well. Um, so, I have got quite a lot of props and things that I have here that I thought I could show you um, and I might come off share my screen so that you can just see me and and I'm going to show you some props and we'll see how it works. Um, we we realise that sometimes just seeing things in real life is just a bit more fun and it breaks up this death by PowerPoint type thing and then we'll go back and look at the PowerPoint later on to show you some tracks and things, stuff that I can't really show you from here. And obviously, I've not got Elaine here from Scotch Badgers, so I can't be running out in the woods in the middle of the night to be showing you all the things either. So let me see if I can stop sharing. Okay. Let me make my thing a bit bigger. Right, I think that's working now. So let me see, my first animal, the first one I'm going to show you is our bat. Now, you might, it kind of looks okay in my office just now, but when you look around, it's just a whole load of strange dead objects. So uh, here we are, I have a little bat here, and this is 
obviously dead, which is a bit sad, but it does let me show you just um, some of the different features of a bat. So people always ask me, is it a type of bird? And um, yeah, do you know, funnily enough, it doesn't seem to be primary school aged kids that ask me that. They seem to know stuff. Um, but the older older ones sometimes just don't get it. They just think it's a bird. They've never really thought about it. So we have to explain that, no, it is a mammal. It's um, warm blooded like us. It's uh, furry like us or has hair. Um, and actually, it's more like us than it is a mouse. It lives for 25 years, probably because it hibernates right enough. And um, a mouse only lives about two or three years. And um, if you look at its hand here, its hand, its wing here, it's like an adapted hand. So you've got a shoulder, an elbow, a wrist, a little thumb sticking up. And these little lines, these little veins are the fingers um, that are elongated. So it's actually in its own group, if you like, Chiroptera, which means hand wing, and it's adapted its wing. And that's what makes the bat super successful. Um, there's a quarter of all mammals are actually bat species, which is unbelievable. And it's because they have this great design, they're able to fly and they're able to do it at night as well, um, especially over here. So um, the, the strange thing is there's all these different types of bat. There's like 1,200 different types of bat in the world, but there's only nine that are tough enough to actually live in Scotland. Um, and I thought we could just talk about a couple of the ones that we're likely to see here. So we've got the pipistrel, um, and there's a few different species of pipistrel, and you can't tell unless you've got a bat detector um, and a left that's alive and it's echolocating. So what a bat does is it uses echolocation in order to try and um, navigate and to catch insects, which is what it likes to eat. So it'll send out a really high pitched beep and it'll wait for the um, echo to return back. And with it, it brings back a kind of map, a sonar map. Um, and it also lets us know, lets it know where its prey is. So the closer and closer and closer it gets, to an insect, the quicker and quicker the beeps will get. So it'll almost like beep, 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 finishing off in a feeding buzz, which will go sort of strange like that. And we know this because we can use our bat detector. It changes the frequencies into something that we can actually hear. So when you're out and about, you would switch it on and it's super sensitive. I don't think it works with the computer on, but it's really, really sensitive and it picks up even just the softest of noises. It'll pick up that um, and it'll pick up all those echolocation noises. And every species of bat has a different song, if you like, almost like a bird. So a pipistrel like this, which you would normally find in woodlands um, because that's where the insects are. They're hunting and they're doing their figure of eight. But if you had this, then you would definitely know it's a pip because you would hear the kind of slappy noises and it always have to do it and I go sounds a bit like that it's so gross um, and if it was a Dubentin bat one of the other bats that you find near the water more um, they're a little bit bigger right enough but that sounds like marbles hitting a tin so kind of and then you always hear the when it catches an insect it's really cool so that's the two different types that you're most likely to see and the places that they're most likely to be and you know, they they are protected by law and uh, you can't disturb them. Um, and people have them staying in their attic, for instance, and they're not allowed to move them. But, you know, they don't do too much damage. They're not like mice. They don't want to eat. And if they are in an attic and they've got a maternity roost, it's all females and they've got their babies. And then they're likely to go off somewhere in the winter and go somewhere else nice and cool so that they can hibernate. Um, but they're they're fascinating creatures. The next thing I would like to show you is, let me see, what will I go into? My big badger here. Oh, <laughs> can you see him? Move my water. This seemed like a good idea, he's really heavy. So badgers, like this one here, um, 
are there's lots of them in in Scotland and Falls of Clyde seems to be the perfect place for badgers. I think it's because it's just such a great habitat. It's on slopes, uh, really good drainage for them. There's lots of foraging ground in nearby fields, nearby woodlands, um, so it's perfect for them. And they have got a perfect design for that underground life as well. Um, so if you could see their claws here, they've got really big claws. And if I show you, I don't know if you can see that all right, but <laughs> it's got a bit dirty. But this is to show you what a badger print would look like. It's got five little jelly bean little toes and a big bean pad and little claw marks, especially the front there. So if you see these little like baby bear marks across the place, then it's likely to be badger. And as I say, they live underground. They have the claw, these amazing claws to help them dig and have up to half a mile of underground tunnels. They have little chambers where they snuggle down and go to sleep. And um, if you look at their face, I suppose it shows you the, the a great shape for digging. So they're not going to have big floppy ears like dogs because they'll just fill with uh, mud. And they've got a wee wedge shaped body and able to get in there. And the first thing I suppose you do notice is are these stripes. And the stripes are really there so that um, it's a bit of a warning really. And although they can be camouflaged if they want, um, when they puff themselves up and look forward and you see that strike in black and white, uh, it is a, a very big warning and it's backed up with a very powerful bite. So let me show you a badger skull. Let me see. So you can always tell a lot about uh, any animal, in fact, by its skull. And this badger skull will show us some other things here. So I just said it had a very powerful bite. So we know it's got a powerful bite because it has this crest, this sagittal crest. So if you ever see a skull with a crest on it like that, it's likely to be a badger. Um, also, these grindy teeth at the back and the big canines at the front show what it would like to eat. So it might um, like to eat meat, but it will also, it's got grindy teeth too, it probably likes to eat all different things. So although it's a carnivore, um, it is omnivorous and it'll pretty much munch what it wants to eat. However, what you normally find it doing is meandering along the ground, sniffing out using this enormous huge, ca huge cavity to sniff out um, its prey. And when it gets its favorite prey, which is actually just worms, it'll stick its uh, nose right into the ground and suck up the worm. And what you do notice is that it can't chew. It has its jaw completely attached here. So it can't chew, so it just sucks up and it can be a bit sort of when it sucks them up and throws it down into its, its mouth there. And you'll quite often see the little kind of, it looks like somebody's put a little paper cup into the ground, a little triangle into the ground where they've had a little snuffle hole to get those worms up. They can eat other things. They'll, um, they'll take anything they can get a hold of, but they're not fast and they're not hunting. They're just wanting to find um, roots, shoots, pig nuts, they love to dig up those as well. Um, they like to eat slugs and if they were to find a dead rabbit, they might munch on that too. Um, what else did I want to say about it? Oh yeah, I didn't talk about the fact that it's a, it's a mustelid. Um, so it's huge sense of smell here. That it does tell us a little bit about what it does and how it communicates. So a mustelid like the stoat and the weasel and the pine martin, um, they all use smell to communicate. So they'll go along and there's a scent gland under their tail. They'll rub that on each other and, and um, scent mark as they go in their territory. And that's telling all others that that's where they live and this is their clan. Um, so it's an important communication technique that. Um, let's go on to our fox next. Now, my fox looks a little bit flat, I have to say. He doesn't look the best. However, if you were here and you were feeling him, 
he feels really flat, uh, really, he does feel flat, feel really like a cat. Um, not, I, when I first felt it, I was expecting it to be more dog-like, but it's actually more cat-like. And if you look at its eyes, it has a vertical slit. And that's like a cat too. So the vertical slit is really thin when it's out in daylight hours because it does come out in daylight hours, but different to the badger who tends to um, mostly be nocturnal or come out in the evenings. Um, but you will find a fox out more other time uh, during the day as well. And it's able to increase its the um, pupil to make sure it can get as much light as possible in when it's the at night time. What you might have noticed if you've been out at night and you've shown a torch and you get these little green eyes shining back at you, there's a little layer in the back of their eyes and that's called the Tapetum Lyceum. And it's a, a little reflective layer and it just flashes that light back and that allows them to use as much light as possible and, and gather it into the eyes so they can help them see in the dark. What you might also notice about the fox is its ears, it's got its pointy ears and it can move them independently. Um, and that allows it to really work out where its prey is and, um, and where about it is in distance really well. So I think what makes a fox really successful is that it can pretty much eat anything. Um, and if you were to look at the skull of a fox, I'll show you the badger again, just so you can see the difference. So the badger is much kind of shorter. So the fox has a, a much bigger nose there. And when you were, have to look inside the cavity, I'm not sure if this will show up, but inside the cavity, it's kind of all like a lattice inside there. And that's, it's called turbinates. And that, increases surface area to give it a really good sense of smell. So I think they're saying it's 300 million sensors in here and we only have 6 million. So it shows you how many different um, olfactory sensors they have compared to us. So they're going out and they're sniffing and that's how they're catching their prey. Um, if it did have teeth, it would have big long canines, big sharp canines and the, the grind teeth at the back as well. Um, but it lives in practically every habitat that it can um, because it eats such a wide variety of food from rabbits to slugs to uh, stuff out of a litter bin that it's found. It will pretty much just be an opportunist and take what it can anywhere. Um, let me see, what else do I want to talk about? Um, oh, let's go on to my other guy here. He's quite tall for in here. So this, <laughs> it's all very odd. I hope I'm giving you a laugh here. But this is our otter. And um, every time I take it anywhere, people think he's a mere cat. And it's maybe because he's been sitting in the window and got completely bleached. So actually it would be a much darker color if I lift up, you can see he would be much brown, more brown under there. He's very sleek. And unlike the fox and the badger, who will have sort of um, woodland habitats and all other habitats that are underground, this guy here wants to live near where it can hunt. And that's going to be near water because it hunts in, in water to catch fish. And it has a perfect design for its life. So it's got a small head, tiny ears, so they're not going to fill up with water. Um, eyes that are quite high up in its head. And if you've seen an otter swimming, um, it, its nose and its eyes and its ears are kind of all in line. So it can kind of um, do everything it needs to do without submerging completely. Because they only stay underwater for up to three minutes and normally only for about 30 seconds. So they're not under for for ages for I was imagining when I was younger that they would be under for you know a half an hour and spend all their time under there um and they've got a tough time I reckon especially in places like the Clyde that have really murky waters at this time of year and they use these whiskers to really help them um navigate underwater 
and find the fish using the, the eddies and the currents. They also have a kind of webbed foot. So if I was to show you the footprint of an otter, it's very different to the badger actually. Uh, and although they've still got the five toes, you can see that the pad is different here and quite often you will see the webbing as well. Um, and of, you might also find it in a completely different place. So you might find your otter footprint down by a beach, for instance. Um, and if you're up next to a badger set and you see some footprints that have got five little toes, then you're thinking mm, that's probably going to be a, bad, a, a, not, a badger rather than an otter. Um, other things to think about with him, uh, he's got his rudder tail, his big long rudder tail to help him swim in the water. So, as I say, all the adaptations that the animals seem to have are just making them the best predators possible in the habitats that they live. And lucky for us, all these habitats are in pretty close proximity to where we live, um, if you know where to look. Now, let me go on to my last one. What is this? This one's easier to show you. So we have an owl here, who's definitely not a mammal. He has um, feathers and doesn't lay, doesn't have live young. It lays eggs, obviously, but it is a major top predator. And it's also, if you're lucky enough to see a lot of owls, it shows that there's enough food round about to. Um, to make sure that it can survive. So it, it's showing that you've got a really good ecosystem around about you. So they're a, a sort of keystone species, if you like, because of that. Um, this guy here, uh, the first thing I notice when I look at, <laughs> look at my tawny owl here is its eyes. Um, now, there's only five different species of owl that live in this country, we've got our tawny owl, our barn owl, our little owl, our what else have we got? The long-eared owl and the short-eared owl. Um, there's a little bit of debate of whether the eagle owl and the snowy owl should be in there, but they don't really reside here, so we'll just myth them out for just now. Um, but I'll use the tawny owl here just to show you the adaptations. The eyes we've got. And these ones are black. Now the other owls sometimes have different colours, like the little owl has really yellow eyes and the long-eared owl has kind of orangey eyes. And it does give an indication to where it hunts, or when, when it hunts, sorry. So if it's dark like this, it's hunting at night. Um, if it's yellow-eyed, then it's going to be hunting maybe in the day more. And if it's orange-eyed, then it might be crepuscular, which means the dawn and dusk. It might be hunting more at those times. So we know this guy comes out at night time. Um, what's really interesting is you would think its eyes are really good. And if we had eyes that size, it'd be the size of tennis balls. However, their eyesight isn't actually that much better than ours. So they have to use other things to help them be this top predator. They've got a kind of heart-shaped face that you can see which is um, a disc faced, which is almost like a satellite dish, gets all the sound waves coming in and they're angled right into its ears, which are below, below its feathers and sort of behind its eyes. And the interesting thing about its ears as well is that one ear is offset and one's a bit higher than the other. And that helps it judge distance really, really well and very accurate. One ear, whole opening is much bigger than the other as well so they get different frequencies in there so their hearing is superb and um, so team that with the fact that they're completely silent hunters if you look at a feather um, along the edges here it's all kind of toothed and that helps it be very silent when it when it goes through the air um, what else does it have oh it's an awesome predator because it has these, it is odd that I have, I go about and I have strange random feet and things, but 
it's awesome at the same time. So you can see it's got four toes. And what's interesting about that toe here is it's able to go forward so it can perch or it can go back like this so that it can catch prey and help carry it back to where it likes to roost um, and perch. So what a bird like this will do is perch out the way uh, you'll not be able to see it, it'll be completely camouflaged because it's got really camouflaged uh, feathers. In fact, all the birds in their own way are, are pretty much camouflaged and they will pop out and jump and, uh, not jump, sorry, fly down and capture the prey that they're after. And they are after the small mammals, predominantly like your shrews and your field voles and things like that. Um, although they will take toads, they will take... Um, anything that they can get a hold of too um, and some have even taken bats in the past as well and they, some individual owls actually get really good really specialized at taking a specific type of foot um, I've actually got a box here um, when I was I was talking to Robbie earlier and he said something about um, Harry one of the guys who works in Irvine and he's given me a box of owl pellets and in that box owl pellets, I think he's gone to one favourite roosting or perching point and picked up all the barn owl pellets. And every barn owl pellet that I've gone through seems to have quite similar food. It's all um, little voles that's in there. So if I show you some of these. So this is a little pellet that I found. That, well, he found this one, actually. This is a barn owl pellet. And it's if you break it open, it's all just fibrous. And what that is, is the undigestive remains of the vole that is eaten. It's taken it down um, into here. It's compressed it all together, got rid of all the digested stuff that it wants to get the nutrients out of. And the rest is coughed back up um, through its gizzard and out. And depending on what's been eating is what will come out. So this has got lots of feathers in it, this one. It's a completely different consistency. And I don't know, I think I might be a bit strange, but it's like it's, it's like Christmas when you open one of these, you get to see what's inside it. Um, and there's certain ways to do it. Some people like to open them dry and discover what's in it that way. And some people like to soak it and, and take their time with it. Um, all mine have been completely frozen for a while so that uh, they've not got any beasties left inside them. And if you do get a chance to look inside, you can find tiny little skulls like this. So this is a little field wool skull. Quite often as well, if I can find my... I use these FSC field guides, which are superb. And it shows you all the different jawbones that you can find. And the idea is that you take your jawbone that you found and match it up and work out whether it's a field vole or a shrew. If it's got little red bits on it here, it would be a shrew. A shrew. Um, it's really handy. And it's just, it's amazing, like, finding uh, this really distinctive pelvis bone or little teeth that are grown from the rodents. Um, so, yeah, so that is our owl. Um, what else was I going to say about it? I think that's everything. So if I can go back now, if everybody's okay, if I can go back to sharing my screen, I will show you some other things that you can look out for when you're out and about. Let me see. Share screen. Seamless. Hmm. <laughs> oh, that's good. I think I'm sh screen sharing. I'm not even sure now. Okay. So there are five. We use these five just because, you know, there's an air of mystery about them because you normally see them mostly nocturnal, mostly at night. Um, but they're actually quite easy to find some of the different signs and tracks and trails about them when you know what to look for and people are so surprised they've walked a path you know for years and never thought that that little off path there has been a badger or a deer or that little snuffle hole might have been a badger um so 
hopefully that you'll get some wee hints and tips for you. Um, the next thing I wanted to show you is about a two and a half minute little clip and what these are are either sort of chance encounters that I've either been out and ha had my phone. Um, a couple of clips are from some of our volunteers from Scottish Badgers that have sent in some stuff, um, some superb clips. And it just shows you uh, not dead animals, <laughs> just some nice little clips for two and a half minutes. So if MD wants to get a glass of water or anything, now's your chance to run off and do that. And for those of you who are fascinated, I'll play this now. This is a Debenton bat that was just right outside the office at Falls of Clyde in the middle of the day. Nobody knows why. Very strange. Maybe it had been disturbed from its roost. And one of her volunteers catching this bat on the trail cam. It's going so fast, I don't know what type it is. And this otter right outside our window again. Sometimes the wildlife just comes to us at Falls of Clyde. I've been missing it this year. It's munching on a fish that is caught. You hear the little squeaks there, squeaky wheel barrel. lovely little fox curling up. Look at those ears showing you how it moves all around, listening out for any possible dangers. It's interesting that it's in a day nest or, or a nest. This is above ground. Neat sound, isn't it? Very different to the vixen call. And the pups are a much darker colour. Wait for it. There's three cubs at that set there. They're always bumbly about and so cute, the babies. A bit wet here. What's so exciting about trail camera footage, you just don't know what you're going to get, um, but you can get little gems and it's a real insight into their private life. Um, our trail camera that we've got didn't cost very much money, um, here it's here, um, but it is, it's a really good one. So on to some tracking fundamentals. Now we know a little bit about some of the wildlife we might see, because it's really important to have that knowledge. Once you've got the knowledge, you can add it to the other stuff and it'll all come together. Um, tracking was, you know, in the past, a really um, primeval thing to do. You know, um, we needed to be able to track, to hunt for food or to look out for um, predators that were going to prey on us. And uh, now, of course, we use it for different ways. We use it for conservation to make sure that um, we know what's happening in the 
the land and um, the ecology and to see how levels of prey are fluctuating and to see if there's anything we need to do to manage the, the situation better. It can also be used for wildlife crime. Um, if we're able to go in and um, as an expert witness, perhaps say, yes, we know that there's three signs here that is definitely showing that this is a badger set, um, then that gives proof to, um, to the police that, you know, something might have happened if they could see that, you know, I'd been dug up or, or that kind of thing. Um, it's really important, obviously, to be prepared when you're going out tracking. Um, I always have a little kit with me, which has a wee first aid kit, um, just in case, sometimes you get brambles and stuff that might scratch you. Um, uh, and also snacks, that's very important too. But it's also a really good idea to make sure that you've got a phone with you, you've got a map with you, that you know where you're going, that you've got a buddy set up so that um, they're either coming with you or that they know when you're going to come back so that you can um, make sure that you're nice and safe. Uh, it's also, you know, risk assessment is something that we teach our young people too. Um, it's something that I teach my kids. You know, they have to not go out if it's blowing a gale or if it's um, too wet, they're going to have to wear a waterproof um, and wear sensible shoes and look out for dangers when they're out there. Um, so that's all stuff that you probably all know because you guys love wildlife and you're out there and you're doing it already. Um, some more tracking techniques. There's me looking a bit strange here, but um, we teach this and me with my hands in the air is me feeling for what we call bug eyes. So you're putting your hands out as far as you can and wiggling your fingers and moving them in and out to find where your peripheral vision is. And what is super interesting is that some people just have really good peripheral vision. Um, people with dyslexia are meant to have better peripheral vision than regular folks. Um, and I, I just, I find that blows my mind that, you know, we're all so different. We've all got a part to play. Um, we also teach uh, deer ears, or it could, I suppose it could be fox ears as well, because you're cupping behind your ears and you're listening out. Um, and it's really important to be able to, to do that directional listen and really focus. Also just walking silently, just practice wildlife walking very stealthily. See if you can get from a place to a place without it making a sound. Uh, another thing that we like to teach is uh, um, to go to a ponder patch, we call it. But really it, all it is, is going somewhere that's that you like. It could be your garden, it could be a walk that you go to. You could stand next to a tree or you could be walking. You don't need to be still. But what you're getting used to is feeling what that place is like normally and in an everyday manner. What is the baseline of that woodland or um, garden or wherever it is that you are? And that baseline will probably be little um, noises, maybe squirrels bouncing about or um, birds chirping. Um, and you get really used to what's meant to be or what is what feels relaxed. And when something's out of the ordinary, you'll start to hear some different things. So you'll start to hear your, um, your blackbird, for instance, going chirp, 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 and doing a high pitched alarm. Um, and the different alarms can mean different things. So, you know, that chirp, chirp, chirp might mean that there's a, a, la, a predator on the ground, like a fox or a cat, but then that's good for you because then you can start looking out for what's around. There might be more of a tss, 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 alarm and that might be that there's something up high. It could be a bird of prey coming, but even that's cool. So when you can start to look out for the different things that are happening, you can start to really read the environment around you, which is a, a skill in itself. And it's just kind of relaxing as well. Um, this looks all very complicated, but all I need you to know from it is that our observations and our vision get fed into our brain. And with that pattern recognition, that we talked about, we're looking at the, the tracks, for instance, some species knowledge that we've already got from talking about the animals there, 
Now we need some logical thinking in order to make that conclusion and deduction. And, you know, there's people in the world that are quite inquisitive and like nature detectives, and, and that's the people that do well with this. So you've got to know what questions to ask. So it's kind of who, where, what, when, why, and how. So look at these signs that were found. So you could be saying, who, let's start simple, who left those tracks there? Um, is it a human? Is it a four-legged creature? Just start simple. Then you're starting to think, right, where, where is this? Where were they going? Um, what were they doing? Were they trying to feed? Were they trying to um, uh, get shelter? Were they just uh, going around their territory? Um, when were they doing it? Was it recent? Um, is it fresh? You can tell this has been in May because there's a um, bluebell in there. Um, why were they doing it? In this case, it looks like there was uh, a, a bee's nest that's been ripped apart. And how did they do it? Did they use their claws? And once you start to ask all these questions, you start to notice various different things and the pieces of the puzzle all come together. It's a great idea to have what we call a master listing. And that is like a, a, a bit in your notebook, really, that you're kind of working out what it possibilities could be. You're like, it's like you're putting everything into a big sieve and you're saying, right, what could it be? Um, okay, we're in a woodland, so it's likely it could be a fox, a dog or a badger. Um, but oh, you would know that there's only four toes, so it can't be a badger. So you start to tick it all off and you narrow down what it is. And sometimes you don't completely come to a conclusion. Sometimes you've got it down to say, well, it might be a dog or it might be a fox. I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, but it's still a, a good process to go to and get used to using. Another thing to do is um, start to look out for some of the various different tracks and trails that are out and about there. So these animal paths, for instance, First thing to do is double check it's not a human track because if it's big enough to fit your two feet and your shoulder width apart, you're probably thinking it's too big to be an animal. Um, the other types of animals that might leave tracks, um, if I'm looking at this track in the left here, I'm thinking, oh, it could be a deer. However, there's there's some trees that are down near there in, in the um background there so it's not really a good throughway for a deer it's too tall a deer would couldn't get under that or over that so my next question would be mm, I wonder if there's any hair stuck on that tree I might go up and I might touch the branch or see if there's any hair under there if you find a badger hair for instance it's going to have the kind of magician's wand look so the white hair with the black band and it doesn't roll very easily in your hand either if it's fox it might have that red color if it's deer it's kind of crimped at the edge white and if you fold it in half it goes in a kind of right angle because they're hollow so it's the only hair that really does that so they're three good things to think of um, and looking out for some hairs and possible uh, culprits, if you like. So if I'm looking here, you're thinking of the size of the hole or the size of the um, trail as well. So obviously that's far too small for a badger on the left, but on the right, that could well have been a badger because something has got a mucky tummy and gone right over that log and left all their muck on the log. So if that had been a, a deer, for instance, it would just have just dropped right over it. Um, sometimes my kids don't like going out walking with me and I think it's because, <laughs> because we don't get very far. I'm like, oh, what's this? And then I'm down in the floor and I'm looking at the footprints that are there. I'm looking to see if there's any hairs because once I've got two or three different corroborating evidence if you like then I know what it is that's been there and I can follow the trail and perhaps find a badger set or whatever. We talked about footprints already but I did want to just point this out because quite often people get these things confused so on the left we have a fox print and on the right we have a dog print 
and the things you look out for that are different, the fox print, the two toes at the front are quite far forward, so you can actually draw a line under them, whereas you don't have that on the right with the dog. Also, the little mane back pad is really small. I've got quite hairy feet, foxes. So if you look at the dog print on the right, it's got you could almost fit three toes in that mane pad. Um, so that's your fox and your dog on either side there. And in the middle, there's a little badger paw print, which is quite cute. Um, and I always remember it. Um, you can see that there's five toes. And you can, oh, let me show you here. There's five toes, one, two, three, four, five. And this little one here is almost like our thumb. So if you look at your right hand and your thumb, I, I don't know if it's reversed now. I'm wondering if the screen is reversed. But anyway, the one that this pointer on is like my thumb. Um, so you can kind of work out whether it's been a left or a right foot. And you can work out whether it's been a front or a back foot by these little um, claws as well. They tend to have much longer claws in the front foot. And of course, I wish you could speak because I would be quizzing you all. Um, this is not any of the mammals we've talked about before. This is a deer. So it's called a deer slot. But it's quite a good one to track too because you can work out just exactly um, what direction it's going in by the direction of the point, if you like. Um, and you can work out how fast it's been going by what it looks like if it has um, a much wider gap between the slots then it's running and it's splayed the the foot if you like the hoof so it's it's fascinating you know you can almost do a talk on every single one of these topics that we've discussed and it's really hard to kind of go quite fast through it all um another thing i wanted to get to was my uh, best topic and uh, another one that my kids can't stand me going on about but I love it every time I'm out it's like who done it who did the poo so on the left here um, you've got something quite high up on a prominent um, spot but something else that also does that is down the bottom right here on a prominent spot these kind of tussocks and they're telling the other animals where their territories are but they're quite distinctive. So you've got a right um, sort of black kind of gooey stuff here with fish scales in it on the left. And that's your otter. And it's got apparently a smell of jasmine tea. Although I, I don't get it. I don't think it smells like jasmine, but it does smell quite sweet to me. It smells, it doesn't smell bad. Whereas a fox poo, um, my dog rolls in it all the time. It's just foul. It's disgusting. It's like sausage shaped with a little sort of thin bit at one end and it stinks. Um, so you can start to notice the difference between these main um, poos. And this one up here is a bit random, sort of stuck in here, but I wanted you to see it. Um, and if you pick that up, you might not be sure whether it's mouse poo or bat poo until you crush it between your fingers. And when you crush these little things between your fingers, if it goes to dust, then it's going to be made of insects. So a bat, like the little pipistrelle I showed you earlier, eats 3,000 midges in a night. So it's entirely made of insects. Um, and if you find that, you might find it down windows if there's a roost nearby. Um, it gives you a good indication that there's bats around. This is horrible, sorry. But this is badger poo. And I'd wanted to show you it just to show that um, it's very distinctive because badgers always dig a little pit, or not always, but mostly dig a little pit to do their poo in. And you can sometimes find them, these latrines with lots of little pits all around with all the poo in it. But it can really vary in what they've been eating. So at this time of year, or maybe a few weeks ago, there was lots of fruit around. So you might find that kind of gloopy, seedy thing um, on the left there. And at other times of the year, you might find it looking more like poo. And if you get a stick, the only good way to tell what smell, uh, what animal you've got is to smell it. It's a stick test. So you give it a good stick in and a wee smell. And it definitely smells chemically a bit like TCP. It's very odd. Um, I've got a few more to show you and then that'll be us. Right, so deer is on the left because it's kind of uh, shiny and it's got a little end. It's got a wee narrow ending and rabbit poo is a lot smaller. It can be all different wee colours there. But it's all very round. 
We talked about pellets, but bear in mind it's not just owls that leave pellets. You can get pellets from um, corvids and other birds of prey as well. So um, it's quite an interesting one we find it. it. Might not always be poo. Just give it a wee inspection, see what you can see. And you do get bat, uh, bird poo quite a lot, and you can tell with that white in it. It's got the uric acid stain. Feeding and foraging. If you're out and about and you see pine cones. Bear in mind that lots of things can nibble on them. So here it's very neat. That indicates a mouse, but it's, it's all just messy and squirrely because the mice are just ripping, uh, the squirrels are just ripping apart um, and they leave quite often a mid and a big pile of them. Here's quite unusual, but you can quite often get um, woodpeckers using trees as a bit of an anvil. So they pop it in and then they can peck and get all the seeds out. Um, and you might also find some leftovers, like this is leftovers from a frog. It's a very, it's just odd stuff to get, I suppose. Um, and I've only seen it once or twice, but it could be an otter that's just left the insides of that because it's not got any value in it to eat. If you find feathers, um, it could just be one feather on its own. In which case, it's probably a bird that's molted it. That happens a lot. Um, in fact, I love to collect feathers and bring them back. I've got a brilliant book to match it up with all the different feathers and see which bird it's from and which side it's from. Um, if it's a bunch of feathers that's been plucked, it's going to be a bird of prey. Um, and quite often you'll find a breastplate left and maybe some wing bones left because the birds of prey just leave that and take all the meat from it. If it's all chewed like this and in clumps, it's most likely to be um, a fox, maybe a cat as well, um, because they chew the feathers off. And there's those badger holes, those snuffle holes I was telling you about. You can look out for them. Quite often there's a, a kind of triangle of spoil behind it too. And the homes are important. So when we talked about the badger being really um, ideal for living underground. Um, it does go and ex excavate quite a lot and um, there can be like up to half a ton of um, spoil in the spoil heap here and um, it's very distinctive. The shape of the hole can be like a, a D turned on its side so it has a, um, a kind of little D shape with a flat bit here whereas this rabbit hole is very, very round and very small. So you can imagine a rabbit going in there. Um, I think people that have very visual imaginations it can imagine things that they'll go, right, well, a, a, a um, rabbit will definitely fit in there, a, a badger will not. Um, uh, although um, nature sometimes just does what it likes. So we have badgers and foxes living in same set sometimes. Um, and uh, it can make it very difficult. So then you're going to have to use your other evidence to work out just who is living there. We've got molehills. We've got little lawns mowed down by water voles. And this, just to throw you, has a spider hole. I always forget to look up. I don't know why. I just, I, I'm always looking down. Um, and when I do look up, you know, it can be really surprising. This kind of dark, compact bit here is going to be your squirrel dray. There's no light getting in there. It's quite big, quite near to the fork of the tree branches, whereas the other bird nests are um, much looser and can be at the edges of the tree. So the last thing I just wanted to say to you was, you know, how important this tracking is. It's not just to go out and be at one with nature and learn skills. It's um, it's really important. You know, there's lots of threats. There's habitat destruction and um, insects decreasing and we need to know what's happening with wildlife so that we can keep an eye on it and and help conserve it where necessary and there's various different ways you can do it you can um, send into i record um, some of your findings um, Scottish Badgers, you can download, if you've seen a set, you can download a set recording form and, and um, put into them any new sets that you've found, which they're always finding interesting. Also, similarly, if you see any roadkills, uh, you can 
let the Scottish Badgers know if there's any road kills. And as far as I know, I think there's an otter one as well. That you can let people know if there's been any otter kills. So I think that's us back to question and answer. So I will stop sharing and see if you're all still there. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's still 65 people there, so you've managed to hang on to most of them. You're all right. Oh, that's good. <laughs> uh, if anybody's got any questions, you want to fire it onto chat. We can, we can, uh, things you can answer anything you want to know, especially about who. It's always interesting when people ask questions about who. <laughs> I know. Uh, there's a, we've got a, we keep one in the car which is a, a poo and pause chart. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Which is we keep handy. The Woodland Trust have a wee poo chart as well. I wonder if it's the same one, and you, it's kind of like a swatch I've book. Never got it to be honest. It's really good. It's a walk your thing. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of, lots of people are saying it's very interesting and thanking you, but nobody's actually asking any questions. <laughs> Could I maybe ask a question? I would be very interested in... This is my wife, by the way, sorry, Lindsay. She's I'm off, like, off to the side. Off <laughs> uh, I'd be very interested in uh, the book of feathers that you spoke about. Oh, right. Okay. Let me see. I have that somewhere. The one that I've been using just now is this one here. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Accent signs. Accent signs. And it says Roy Brown, John Ferguson, Michael Lawrence, and somebody else, somebody Lee's, um, which is quite good. And I love the FSC guides. Um, I actually have given out my tracks, trails, and signs one, and they've got an amazing bird one to do bird tracks and things as well, because bird tracks are really interesting. You know, like a crow has got this wee back bit so it can perch. Um, but you know ducks don't have that you know they they don't need their perching back toe and if it's a pigeon it's got a kind of like little sort of semi-circle shape to it instead it's it's all really interesting um but yeah the fsc guys are really good they've got loads of information a couple of questions popped up somebody's asking what type of camera do you use for light tracking um that's these ones here these um trail cameras I've got an infrared light on them so all the trail cameras I got one from my son that was only 40 pounds and uh, although it's not the best quality that was the one that got the you know the badger up close sniffing at the the trail camera so I mean it, it did pretty well it also gets lots of mice in our garden and things like that as well um but yeah they're, they don't need to be too expensive um this one was a wee bit more expensive i think it was 150 or something um and it's because we keep it outside a little bit longer so we just wanted to make sure it was safe I, irene's asking she's the badger's nose looks a bit of a snout would that be right yeah I would call it a snow, definitely. Awesome. I get confused, especially when my notes aren't in front of me. I do see random, <laughs> <laughs> see random things quite often. Yeah, Leslie, so I don't know what I called it. Leslie says, excellent talk, thank you. Am I right in thinking that otters have runs that they use? Like yes. That. Yeah, I was at um, a place called Cunningar Loop. I don't know if you've heard of that. I don't even know where to describe where that is now. Is it Cumbernauld? Wait, I don't know. I'll need to look that up. That's terrible. Um but they had um, a bit going down to the river and there was an otter holt, which they called it, which was this little round bit. And you wouldn't really have known it was an otter holt other than there was um, just a round hole. There was footprints. And then they had this, yeah, like a slip slide down into <laughs> the water from it. It was cool. Um, so, yeah, yeah, they do have runs. Uh -huh. uh, how how big an area do badgers need? Because as I was saying earlier on, we've got this woodland next door and I'm, I'm, I keep seeing dug up bits of ground around the, the, the wood when I'm walking. And I keep wondering whether it's dogs or badgers, but I've never actually sort of wandered off into the depth of the woods to find if there's anywhere where they might be. Oh, yeah, you must. Quite um, a big thing about a badger set. A badger set, yeah, it can be, there's all different types. You get sort of outlier sets that can just have sort of one or two. Um, badgers, we've found all this information just recently. There's loads of studies being done to show that badgers are sleeping in uh, nests as well. So they can spend some of their time during the day and some time at night in 
above ground nests below trees and things it's it's bizarre and very cute um but yeah if you happen across a, a set the one that i showed a picture of um and the one that up the road from me is about 10 holes um but you can get them up to 30 holes um and you can get them down to two holes and it'll just depend on the amount of food you've got and where you live to how many badgers there's going to be um falls of clyde they seem to there's loads of sets um in fact i remember john derbyshire from years and years ago saying you're never more than five meters from a badger or something there's some sort of um and i don't know where he got that statistic from but i could well believe it you know there's just a, a very high density just because it's it's really um it's a really good place for them to be love the woodlands and all that mm, but i uh, up north, um, I think, you know, the further up they have to go and the further they have to hunt, I suppose they're going to have a bigger territory, a lot like foxes and things as well. They can have like 40,000 or 4,000 hectares, sorry. Mm, big, big mm. Well, that looks like we're, our questions have come to a halt. So thank you very okay. much, Lindsay. That has been excellent. Very educational. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, thank you very much. I'd just like to remind... The Ayrshire group and anybody else who wants to pop in, there are more events up on the, up on the, uh, oh, somebody's asking, would it be possible to show the slide with stating what, when, how, etc. as you didn't say who the footprints belong to and the type of activity that pertains Oh, I didn't, to didn't I know. I just glossed right over it. It was rubbish. <laughs> <Sorry>. Bad lassie. <laughs> yeah, right, let me see if I can go Quite backwards black. now. Don't even know how. No. Um, somewhere. I reverse. Pointer arrows. I wonder if that will give me it back. This was my previous slide. Not too fast. No. Yeah. Oh, right. Wow. Okay. So it was actually it's all badger. That that was meant to be my thing. So your badger paw prints are here. There's got one. There's almost a bit here, two, three, four, five. And they're walking along, just a muddy puddle. This one's actually um, just the main path outside uh, Mid Lodge at Coraline, at uh, the Falls of Clyde. So you've got your main little pad here and your five little toes and some claws. So once you start seeing it, you can't stop seeing it. There's badger everywhere. This path could really be anything, um, but yeah, it's the right shape for a badger. And if you follow it along, it actually does lead to a badger set. You don't have to go very far. Um, there was also another statistic firing about that if you see a badger dead in the roads, that there's a set within 500 metres of it. So mm. it just gives you an idea of, you know, maybe they're not at all times going that far. Um, this is uh, it's not the best example of a badger hole. But I think that's the point. Like, if you're not sure, put it together with all the things. Um, and, yeah, this looks like a little bit of bedding. So quite often, if you look through that, you'll see the badger hairs in there. And it's a little ball of bedding that's been left or maybe abandoned because they've ran down their hole out of harm's way. And then you might want to look in this one. You might want to look for claw marks or parts where it's been dug out or... I once came across a badger um, completely getting stung all over, uh, eating a nest. And I, I was about a metre away from it and it still didn't notice me because it was just eating away <laughs> all the wee grubs and things inside. So I hope that's helped. On, on the, on the other couple of other questions is about picking the scat and poo and skulls home. I take it you're perfectly at liberty to pick them up and take them home and check them out. There's no... Well, yeah. always saying you can't. Um, no, I don't think so. There's certain things that are like I have to have a license to have. What do I have? I have to have a license for Probably. from an otter. Oh. My otter is, you know, to have an actual dead otter. I need to have a license for that. Um, but most other things, if you can prove where you've got it from, it'll be absolutely fine. You just need to make sure that you're doing it in a nice, clean way. I know some rangers and things who'll um, 
leave things outside in maybe a cage if it's like being a carcass or something in a cage and then everything comes and eats it all and then you're left with your lovely carcass but I've not I've not done that yet I just seem to have happened upon you it is a bit grim isn't it it's yeah. fascinating <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's, I think I think that's Oh, hang on. Living a girl who is owned and managed by forestry, this has meant that diversity of habit has suffered. Is there any evidence to say that our mammal population suffered owing to the spread of forest agriculture? I think mm. it's reasonably safe to say yes, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I don't know offhand of the evidence, but yeah, I would I would suggest maybe there will be. I mean, if you're putting a monoculture in, then but you're going to... I must admit there were a lot of the monoculture forests were on open ground to start with so they've not probably well, some yeah. obviously have them taken down old old forest and put new forest in but um, I know for a lot of the forests I know it's certainly around here they were yeah. open ground so I it think um, impacted on current old foresty type stuff I think it's like man just has an impact I mean that's one of the biggest things that's we're telling uh, the, the kids you know everything <laughs> everything we're doing just has an impact you know we get better at farming and then you know the poor owls end up dying off because there's not enough rodents left because they're not getting to eat all the wee bits that are left over and you know it all has a knock-on effect so yeah we just need to do our bit, all of us. I found some more. There's folk with fire in chat. There's, but there's also a Q&A box, which I've just found. So sorry about that. Um, somebody was saying they were interested in the otter squeak. Do they do other calls? Yeah. Uh, the only call I ever hear is a squeaky call. And it tends to be, um, especially if there's a, a young one and an adult and they're calling to each other when they're fishing. And it's normally the young one begging, going, ee, ee, ee. Mm. And I'm sure they do uh, other calls, like there's 20 calls for a, a fox and there's, um, I don't know, something like 17 different calls a badger makes, like wickering and all different ones. So there will be different things they do, but um, it's that whistle that's the most distinctive, I think. Other questions, uh, given, given how you were struggling to get them onto the table, how much does a badger weigh normally? Oh, God, I don't know. Should I know that? I'd feel like I knew that once in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I would have known that. I wonder if it's in my notes. Mm. A lot. A good few kilos. I just don't... I, it's, do you know, You know. it's so interesting talking about how different people's brains work. Mine does not work mathematically. I remember in my um, university exam getting asked how much an elephant would weigh and it just meant nothing to me. I was just like, I have no idea. It's like, but if a horse weighs this, how much would this weigh? I'm like, I don't three, know. Three double-decker buses. That's <laughs> one or other, isn't it? It's something easier. There's many double-decker buses or it's as many elephants. <laughs> I mean, well, I do, listen, I do know that my, my dog is about 10 kilograms, so I reckon must be about 20, 30 kilograms. I don't know. And they as big as that. Yeah, they're much bigger and fatter. Yeah. Big, so, big sturdy beasts, right? So, yeah. Right, I think I think I've managed to get through all the questions. <laughs> Unless somebody wants to point out any more, do we? Well, anyone can. Uh, well, get how big, how big an area does an otter usually range? There you go. Oh, do you know I read that actually? I remember writing that down. I was going to say eleven kilometers to twenty kilometers. Yeah. I have written it down, no, so it I, must be true. <laughs> I read it. Yeah. Okay, copy okay, that size. Thank you very much, Lindsay. No bother. If anyone needs to ask another question, um, feel free to fire it over. And also that uh, Let's Notice Nature Facebook page. I know Facebook isn't everybody's thing, but um, if you're stuck in stuff, it's quite a good throw it on. And we, we all love it. We're like, ooh, what could it be? Something to answer. <laughs> yeah. Right. Excellent. Well, there isn't, from, from our point of view, there isn't a, 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 an Ayrshire group uh, chat, uh, talk in December because we're usually very close to Christmas. So we've sort of given it up. So um, we're not having anything this year either. Our next talk will be in January, and it's Daisy Whittock, who was meant to be our first talk, talking about the Coalfield Initiative up in East Ayrshire uh, and the fact that they're reclaiming and rewilding all the, uh, the open casts and getting the, the peat bogs back and stuff like that. So and Daisy um, is so enthusiastic, it's unreal. So yeah, she is great fun. So hopefully we'll see you all then. And I say thanks again, Lindsay, and thanks again for everybody that's sat through it all with us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye.